Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the, the real Robin Bradley Bums. is dropping. What it is, Brad Lee back in the house, folks. And today, do I got a real treat for you. As you know, I'm always bringing you people that have been places, done things, and or learned the hard way various things that got them past challenges and objections. And today is no different except for it's the most unbelievable guest I think you're ever going to want to talk to. His name is Joe Foster. You may not have heard of him. I didn't hear of him. But when you hear of what he built, then you'll know exactly who he is. And that is the company Reebok. Welcome, Mr. Foster. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for the invitation. Man, dude, I can't even believe I get to talk to you. Reebok is a worldwide brand, worldwide company. You came out with a book called Shoemaker. It's sitting behind you on your right shoulder. If you guys haven't already got his book, I would highly suggest you go and get it right now. Um, it's a great book. It tells your entire story. It's motivational, inspirational, but more importantly, it gets people to understand the value of Reebok. If you ask me, it's 20 years too late. I'll bet you if you'd have came out with that book, 20, 30 years ago, it would have, it would have sold even a thousand times more shoes. Don't you think? Well, it's just a bigger challenge. That's all. We, we're going to get there. We, we can, we can do it. Like that. It's the latest challenge. Get to number one now with the book and probably put some more energy back into the brand. A hundred percent right there is what I was going at. Because like before I read your book, I really, I mean, when you name the top, shoe companies, you know, you, everyone will say Nike, everyone will say Reebok, everyone will say Adidas, you know, and back in the day, like you were in the business when they were just coming up as well. But at the end of the day, you're in the top name brands. I didn't know you, I knew Reebok, but now that I know you and I know the story, it makes me want to go out and buy Reebok. It makes me want to wear Reebok. Well, that's good. That's what I hope other people want to do as well. And one of the reasons for writing, of course. Yeah. Well, again, if it, it, it's a hell of a book, if everybody listening uh, will do me a favor and go get it, I will have to say less and less over the next two years trying to drop bombs on building businesses. So now that I got you here, let's talk a little bit. So do you, st you right now you say you're in France on lockdown? That's right. Yes. Yes. We, we have a property here in France and uh, uh, we, it's, it's a little bit warmer than, uh, than the UK. So we come here. The, it's quiet here. Nice and quiet, no people about, and we just enjoy driving down the roads here. When they let us out, of course. Now, you're not in the same place that, because you bought a place in France, like a little motor mobile home, made it a made it a, a, a office <laughs> in France, didn't you? That was our first international office, yes. <clears throat> but we, we sold that office many, many years ago, yes. In fact, we sold that office to set up Reebok France. So, but you've been going to France for a long time. Oh yeah, yeah. We well, we 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 love Europe. We lo love driving too. But that's basically, as you know, you've read the book. I travelled an awful lot, and I still travel. But I don't fly as much these days. I mean, ignoring COVID. If if COVID wasn't here, we would be driving around Europe anyway. And uh, I drive around to meet up with the friends that we made, that I made, in putting on distribution through France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Spain. All these people, we still know them. I still know them. And it's nice to turn up, sit down, enjoy a few stories, a few memories, and have a drink. That's a beautiful thing. Nice. So, so, so do you, are you also living in the UK like in summers or anything, or are you permanently in France? No, we go backwards and forwards. We, uh, we go, in fact, since we've been doing the book, which we can say has been, ooh, well, seven years <laughs> totally, but for the last three years, we've been trying to get it through, finish it, rewrite it, get it to publishing. So we go backwards and forwards to, uh, to the UK quite often. Still Bolton? Fact, we'll leave next week to Bolton, yes. <laughs> so, so you were like damn near born and raised in Bolton. I was born and raised in Bolton, yes. I was like, born pre-war. <laughs> that is incredible that you are. And how big is Bolton? 
Big, Bolton is about 90,000 people, quite mm -hmm. big, but it's very mm -hmm. near to Manchester. So Manchester's the main city. Are you like a celeb there? No, no. Uh, very few people know me, as you don't know me. My, my mission in life was to sell Reebok, not to sell Joe Foster. <clears throat> and I didn't want to get in the way of the brand. So take a low profile. Do you think anything has changed? Do you think if someone's building a brand right now, they should follow the same exact model? Or do you think building a personal brand is important nowadays? I, I think you can still build a brand, but now we're, we're some, uh, how many years now, 50, 60 years on since I started the brand. Uh, and I think what we have now is technology. Whereas I had to go flying all around the world. I traveled the world a lot. We had no computers with no, uh, no mobile phones. So the only way to really do this was to go meet people. I think now, these days, as we're talking here, <laughs> many miles separated, but we can sit down and talk face to face, which is great. But I couldn't do that. In fact, even making a telephone, I had to wait till I went, uh, got to a hotel. When I got to a hotel, then I could probably make a phone call. That's if there was a line that was free. So lockdown in France, and you said half of Europe or all of Europe is pretty much locked down. What's the, what's the general consensus in Europe over the stupidity here with our election? Do people think, do, do people think that Trump is, 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 is being a prick and everybody likes Biden or, or do people like Biden and think uh, he's stealing the election? Which one? Well, I mean, that's, that's political and I'm not political. The, the main thing for me, as far as I'm concerned, is that, uh, uh, that Donald Trump is probably pushing the boat a lot, a lot more differently and farther than we would expect him to do. But uh, I think most people would expect that, uh, okay, Biden won. So it's his choice now. It's his turn. Well, I, we believe here, at least in the U S that the, that the mainstream media kind of shows the narrative they want to show. So I was wondering somebody outside the United States, what's the, what's the narrative on the mainstream media there about our election? I'm sure it's world news. Well, <clears throat> I don't think it's as big a news as you might think the election was big news, but of course now it gets boring. It's just the same story. It's uh, lawsuits and throwing out lawsuits. And I don't think people, now I expect anything more than process. That once we get through to December, a little more into December, it will, it will happen. And uh, it, we read about it on occasions. And I, I probably pick something up every morning to see what the latest, uh, <laughs> the latest things that are going on. But uh, I think most people are, are now a bit surprised, but then again, being Donald Trump, not surprised. And, just allowing for due process. How's how's the COVID affecting Europe? Is it is it is there any conspiracy on your mainstream media that says, oh, there's not as many people dying as they act like, or is it is everybody taking things seriously? Oh, I think they're taking things seriously. I mean, there are a lot of people in whatever country you go to who just want to ignore any rules or uh, any safety measures, but. Um, I, th I think it's, they're all taking it pretty seriously. We're all on lockdown. I think the whole of Europe at the moment is on lockdown. Uh, it's just that nobody wants to cancel Christmas. So <laughs> I think given another two weeks or so. In fact, the, I think the Prime Minister was announcing today the amount of uh, relaxation that will be going on over the Christmas period. And then after Christmas, we'll be locked down again. I think we're, we're more interested in the, uh, in the vaccines that are being produced and really, and I think this is taking, this is taking Donald Trump off the headlines. Damn vaccines. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy to get a perspective from outside the U S. So thank you for that. That's interesting. Now, uh, Reebok is obviously a worldwide brand. What is a brand like that worth just to give people perspective? Is that a, is that a multi-billion dollar organization? Um, right now, I think they're just short of $2 billion. But when I retired from the company back in 1989, we were nearly $4 billion. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, out of curiosity, yeah. do you think that has any relation to you retiring? Um, 
well, yes, the relation to, to me retiring is by that time the company had become so big that the journey, which I mean, I, I assume you've read the book. Having read the book, you will uh, you will understand the journey was uh, long, and in sometimes good. difficult. Uh, plus, there was a lot of pleasure in it. But by the time I retired, we were number one. Uh, I was just sitting in an airplane, flying, being met with a limousine, going to the best hotels, and sitting down just talking over things. And the uh, the journey was over for me, and uh, it was just nicer to say, "Well, look, I'm retiring." However, on saying I retired, it's a bit like Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. And they were always coming back for me for this, for what it is. And in recent uh, recent days, uh, well, about four years ago now, they, uh, they've opened an archive. And on opening an archive, they want as much history from me as they can get. Uh, plus, I had a lot of bits and pieces in my attic, which, you know, what you do with them, better that they're in an archive. So, uh, yeah, for me, it was... Uh, Easy to step away from a day-to-day -day routine, which was, I mean, you're talking to more lawyers and accountants than you're talking to people. Yeah, interesting. So, so how does it feel? Like, is it is it something that that really you think about, or or how does it feel to know you built a billion, multi-billion-dollar organization from scratch? Does it feel like? Well, I think it's like, you know, it, overnight success in 31 years is step at a time. And you do some steps forward, some steps back. <clears throat> and you, you keep on moving. So it's so incremental. You rarely, you really don't know what's happening until all, all of a sudden. And I mean, the, the, big, <clears throat> the big thing was uh, breaking into the American market with our uh, Aztec shoe. That was a big breakthrough. And then once we got there, the next breakthrough was Arnold Martinez, his wife, who was going through the aerobics classes, and he didn't know what they were. And they said, well, it's exercise and music. So he went to have a look, and that's how the aerobic shoe freestyle was born. And that yeah. blew the company into the water. Yeah, massive. Yeah, I think you said that was like the biggest uh, instrumental piece was the aerobics boom but that, that grew the company tremendously indeed i mean from about nine billion up to uh nine million up to up to nearly a billion in about four years which was incredible <laughs> different is, problems then. different problems yeah, but, in the were, were you guys like popping champagne and just excited and pumped to go to work every day of course oh yeah i mean it it's brilliant working for a company that's growing and growing at such speed and being uh, doing everything that you'd uh, you, you could never even dream of that sort of uh, I say growth or, or achieving so much. It was brilliant. So yes. What do you think the number one like marketing tactic you did best? Like for example, a celebrity endorsement, athlete endorsement, commercials, TV commercials. What do you think the number one performing marketing strategy you guys used? Well, we used all that you're talking about, but, but the big thing that really happened was the aerobics market. And when that happened, it was Adidas, Nike, you named them Brooks, New Balance. They were all male, well-known in America, male and sweaty. This was a new shoe, and it was for women. And all of a sudden, women had something they'd never had before. So and there was, it was deliberate to do it for women, but really whether that was considered to be the way to market it uh, is difficult to say because being down in Los Angeles, all the, uh, the A-listers, all the film stars picked up on, on the shoe and... And the women just loved it and they just went global. How much do you think it, if you're aware of these things, cause I, I've never obviously ran a billion dollar company. Mine's up to eight figures. So we're doing, we're doing decent. We haven't had that hockey stick growth. However, the reason I'm asking you some of these things, cause I need to kind of pick your brain 
for for my company. I want it to one day reach a billion dollars. There's people listening that would obviously dream of making a billion dollar company. What would you say to someone who's just starting a company? What are the main things that they should pay attention to? Well, the, the main thing is you, you've got to be in love with your company. You've got to have the passion and you've got to work hard and keep working hard because you don't get through that, uh, that, that massive door immediately. It takes a lot of time and you have to have a lot of luck. We had a lot of luck because running was growing when we got into running and we were a running company. Aerobics was just at the beginning when we hit it. So <clears throat> it's seeing the opportunities and having the luck that it will work for you. If you can do that, that's fine. Seeing the opportunities. I like that. Hey, and you know, what's cool about you is like, you're, you, you obviously don't need to sell anybody, anything you're retired. You're just kind of, you know, on a little bit of a, pedestal for me because again you don't need anything you don't want anything you're just kind of sharing your knowledge so if if anybody else asked out there would say luck you need luck that's a rare answer why do you and i agree with it by the way because again i people ask me you know what do i think about things and i tell people basically the bottom line truth and 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 sometimes you do need a little luck i mean what do you think luck looks like how do you see the opportunities and have a little luck could you rep could you do you think you could duplicate uh what you did again that's very difficult at this age the the, the problem is that when you're young i was 23 my brother jeff was 25 and we decided we'd set up our own company what could go wrong nothing you totally uh, undefeatable, you know, you can do these things. And so when, when you're young, you, you, you can afford such a, an approach. Uh, as, as you get a bit older, I don't think you can. I think you've got to make your mind when you fill in. The younger you are, the, the better it is. Because what you do is you certainly learn what works. I, we need to go back to my grandfather in 1895 when he made his own pair of shoes. By 1900, he, he was... He, he was looking for people to give his shoes to, people who would influence. So he got influencers, and he did that into the 1920s when he was supplying almost every Olympic team, uh, even the American team and the, uh, and the German team were, were wearing Fosters. So his, he knew how to sell his shoes. Uh, and I think uh, if we look at today, uh, Reebok today are uh, using influence, but so is everybody else. So you've got to influence uh, your customer. You've also got to know your customer. You know, anybody in between, that's one thing, but really know who you're selling to. And that struck me when I tried to sell through the retail uh, business back in the UK. And I used to go in in my early days in the UK and say, look, I'm from Reebok. And the, the shop owner would say, who? I said, Reebok. And who's Reebok? Well, we're a small company. They said, look, I've got Adidas. I've got Dunlop. Why do I need Reebok? That struck home. He didn't. Why did he need Reebok? He didn't need Reebok. The, the athletes needed Reebok. We needed the athletes. And so it was, um, it was a little while later when I went. I, I was very fortunate again that uh, athletics, the three A's, the Amateur Athletic Association, had a handbook. And there's about 500 different clubs in that handbook. And I had the name and address of every secretary. So I went straight to the athletes, gave them a slight discount, and we started to grow our business. And uh, then, then that's when the retail, the man in between, he will stock it only if he's being asked for it. So that's how I was Yeah. Do you think you were a good closer, Joe? <laughs> I, I don't know, really. I, I think I'm good at seeing where the luck is. <clears throat> and if that's a good closer, that's one thing. But I think uh, seeing the luck um, and being able to make your mind up that <clears throat> you, you really, if you have an ambition, recognize it and uh, 
keep pushing along that route so that uh, you don't get diverted. Don't take too much uh, advice. <clears throat> Best thing is your own advice, something you can look at yourself. Listen to everybody, but be careful what that advice is. So as these shop owners were basically saying no, and you were leaving without the sale, do you think you're, you're, do you think you were an average salesperson or, I mean, in other words, do you think someone else could have sold them your shoe or, or do you think, or do you think, uh, you know, they just weren't buying from anybody? No, I was a lousy salesman. I, I, I was not a salesman. I was a marketing man, a planner. Uh, I had to work at it. Um, I think a salesman would still be doing his job on the market, selling the shoes. I, I needed to sell the brand. I, that's what I needed to. I needed to sell the brand, the mission, the idea, the thought that you would do better if you were wearing Reebok. And uh, so meeting, I, I had a great friend who was a great salesman and he could, go, he could sell anything. He could just go in there and he used to throw a packet of cigarettes onto the, on, on, the, on the bench and then they'd have a chat. He would, um, he would know the, the name of the owner, his wife, how many children he had, when the birthdays, he had it all written down. He, he was a professional salesman, but he was selling. That, that wasn't for me. I, I, needed that, uh, I needed a retailer to buy for me, not for me to sell to him. That's interesting. And, and, and here's what's crazy, too, because people think, you know, and I would have said before listening to you, I would have agreed to this. You have to be badass salesperson in order to succeed in life. But you just admitted that you were an average salesperson that still succeeded and succeeded in a huge fashion. So so that would tend to, you know, convince me that I'm wrong. I thought you had to be a badass closer in order to in order to literally blow up your business. But in, in this case, apparently it wasn't, it's not the case. That's just crazy. I like how you just straight up admit, you know, I'm, I was an average salesperson. So marketing is more important than selling. Agree? Definitely agree. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Selling. Oh. Um, I mean, we, we want to, we want to be selling to the user, the man in between, he is just a, an agent. He is somebody who will buy the shit. Selling to, selling to the retailer wasn't my mission. My mission was to uh, sell to the, uh, the user, the athlete. And the, the, re the retailer was the man to stock the shoe to make it available. But that's not selling. That, most retailers don't sell. Most retailers uh, are in there and somebody comes to buy something off them. Retailers don't sell. Retailers more fulfill. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, well, again, I would 100% agree with that because if I go into a store, rarely, well, I don't know, though, because sometimes I'll walk into a store and see a product that's on the shelf that I didn't know about. So I, did, was, I wasn't really marketed to to get me there, but the store itself definitely marketed to get me there. That's, that's unbelievable. Now, when you're using these athletes, like approximately how much does it cost to get like a, like a top athlete to wear your brand? Well, in my day, my early days, it cost nothing. It just cost shoes, just cost the product. Now, <laughs> nowadays, I mean, this is where everything's gone now. So today, it could cost you a million bucks just for a year. So you, and you better make that money. So you, I mean, the real need now is you have to have the product that goes street if you're talking sport. <clears throat> if it doesn't go street, then you're not going to get the volume. So everything now is aimed at street. I think the latest one for Reebok is Cardi B, and they've just got a model, few models out with her. And I don't know what the sales are like, but certainly the publicity seems to be pretty big. You just used the word street. You want to go street. Did you say street? S-T-R-E-E-T? Yeah. Yes. Which means you want to go street level? No, no, no. The volume, you can only sell the volume if the shoes are sold for street work. You know, not just performance. Performance is one thing. You're making a performance product, but unless it gotcha. runs over onto the street and everybody wants to wear that shoe because they're, they're influenced by whatever, by an athlete, by the person, by um, a big club, Manchester United, as far as the uh, UK is concerned, maybe, I don't know, Boston Red Sox or uh, the LA Rams, whoever it is, you know, 
whoever people people follow. It's the spectator sports that are, that are really influencing or, or are influenced by whatever the players were. If somebody was going to start a shoe company today, would you advise it or say it's too saturated now? Good luck. I don't know. I, I'd say, look, if you've got the mission, you know what you're doing, you know the new technologies, because technology these days, that's the big thing. If you, need, if you know the new technology, then go for it. I, I would never stop anybody having to go. If they have that uh, feeling, uh, the passion, you, you, you need everything, the knowledge, uh, when we made our products in those early days, we had the passion, we had the knowledge. We went to college to learn if we could learn anything new. So uh, you've really got to be behind your product. If you are, go for it. A lot of people say that you shouldn't work with family. How did you find working with your brother in the family business? I mean, do you, do you think don't work with your family? If you could redo it all, was that a mistake or was that obviously instrumental? Well, I, I think that we, we've grown, obviously grown up. My grandfather died before I was born, which meant the J.W. Foster and Sons company was being run by my uncle and father, and they did not get on at all. In fact, they were feuding most of the time, which meant the company couldn't get on. So I, d I don't care who you're with. If it's a partnership, um, it, it can be a, can be a problem. 50-50 ownerships and working in families can, can be a problem. But Jeff and I, we didn't. I think we'd seen it so much with my father and uncle that we, we knew. We, we knew not to fight if we had a problem. And we never had a problem. Jeff, he used to work in the factory. He just ran the factory. And that's what he wanted to do. The rest he left to me, and I just got on with it. And you got on with it in a big, <laughs> big way. You built a worldwide brand. Does, don't you ever look in the mirror and think, dude, that's crazy. You built a worldwide brand. Nobody in the world has, has not heard of Reebok. Well, I mean, it, it certainly it was crazy. And uh, once, we, once we hit the, uh, the, the aerobics button, that really exploded everything. And then, yes, I mean, one or two events happened in life, which were, again, a bit of luck. A lot of, uh, how do you say, wanting to be there, energy. And, uh, and, and, and that was it. The, so the, I mean, the moment that we became number one, we, were, we became bigger than Nike, bigger than Adidas. Um, and that was when we were just short of four billion. And that... That was a terrific time. But as I say, at that time, um, we were being run by grocers, really. They were accountants and lawyers. Everything was numbers. And how many in a box? You know, it's not, you're not selling a pair of shoes. And you're not just meeting people. So uh, that's, that's when we became, became really, really big. And, and I, and I guess you need to be an, a different type of person to, to run a company at that size because how, how much you're meeting people and how much you're sitting down to figure out the next billion dollars, I don't know. But for me, the journey that I had was fantastic. Do you, do you still own Reebok or have, have you sold? No. no, no, sold long ago. So, yeah. so, so you're sitting there with all the money you can spend, all the money you need. You have no need for money whatsoever. <laughs> I would assume. Maybe an, that may be an exaggeration. So, so here's my question. If, if somebody said, Hey, look, you got to get an athlete. Cause obviously you guys did. Would you say that's instrumental? I mean, what if the aerobics boom never happened? You, you probably would have just found another way to do it. Well, we were doing pretty nicely on running. I mean, the, the running was growing very nicely. And Arnold went to see Paul Feynman up in Boston and said, Paul, there's this new event going on down here in, uh, in Los Angeles. We should make shoes. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Forget it. Forget it. We're doing great with running. Who wants to make a few shoes for a few girls down in Los Angeles? And, uh, and Arnold just went round his back and had production make, uh, make him 200 pairs. So, you know, I mean, and that, that's fantastic, you know, because he just gave them out and to the instructors and it just took off. So when you talk about, you know, did anybody design that? 
not really. It happened to be there. We happened to be there. The luck was there that, uh, and it worked. And Arthur had this great idea, we'll make them out of blood leather. So he had them made out of blood leather. And I said, no, 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 don't make them out of blood leather. But these are made out of blood leather. And of course, they fell apart in about three, four weeks, five weeks time, they were ripping it. We did cure that, that got cured. But uh, now had that happened in most countries in this world, we would have been dead. However, in America, it's, it's a place where if you do something wrong, but it's great, they'll love it, they'll give you another chance. And, and that's what happened. And in America, that does happen. And that's why if anybody to me wants to grow and become a global, uh, a global company, they've really got to consider doing it in America, getting to America and making sure that uh, the, brand, the brand is well known there. Because I knew that once we, once we had America, really, uh, once we were going well in America, brought through the market, the rest of the world would be easy. <clears throat> and it was. I was going around, I wasn't having to look hard as I'd, I'd spent 11 years finding that distribution in America. But I didn't have to find a distribution in the rest of the world. They came to me and I was going around looking at their organization and just putting them on. So it, it becomes different at that point. Mm. So interesting, interesting. Now, I know, so some of my questions that I wanted to ask you were based on today of Reebok. Like I know they, they, they were big with the UFC as well, but now, but now mm-hmm. something happened where there, uh, there's something changing with the UFC, but you wouldn't know, are you still day-to-day business or you just, you, you're, you're enjoying life now. Like you, I just hear what goes on. Um, what? I do, get, I, I do get to America and I do get to see uh, Reebok. Uh, well, when COVID is not, not around, of course. And uh, it, it is interesting how many uh, of the Reebok companies now are buying my book. I think I've got about uh, 400, 400 books to sign next week that are going to different Reebok companies. Does your brother get, does your, did your brother get any like, like notoriety? in the town in the factory level, like everybody's got to know, like I, I would think somebody in my hometown of 90,000 people turned out to be, you know, Microsoft founder, Reebok, Nike, Adidas, any of the big, big, big company founders that they would be known locally. We, we are known locally, but uh, <clears throat> again, I've been retired for 30 years. Um, the, Reebok sponsored, we sponsored the local football club, Bolton Wonders. So, uh, and we, we took Hollywood into Bolton. We had some very nice uh, nights where we had Charlton Heston, um, Veronica Hamill. I, I think there were quite a few that uh, we brought up to Bolton. And they, they said a night with us. Oh, yeah, we, we became quite famous in Bolton. In fact, the, the stadium now is not called uh, after Reebok. The stadium some years ago went over to another company and then it's the University of Bolton who now sponsor it. But still everybody who goes to the, uh, uh, well, it's a, a mall now, it's a big mall as well as the stadium's part of it. Um, and they all say, we're going to the Reebok. Everybody say, we're still going to, even though it's now 10 years since or more that uh, Reebok stopped sponsoring. <clears throat> but, so yeah, we're, we're pretty famous in Bolton. There's no question about that. <clears throat> now in your book, there was a lawsuit or, or you got that paper and you were, you were freaking out and you walked in and you know, you, you had to hire that, that guy to, uh, it's called a solicitor. You had to hire yeah. the solicitor to protect you. I can't remember what happened. What was that lawsuit that almost knocked you out of business? If that would have went the wrong way. Well, that's when we, um, that's when we had to change our name because we started in, uh, we started as Mercury Sports Football. And we, after 18 months, our accountant, he said, come on, you've got to register your name. And uh, I said, why? And he said, well, if anybody else comes along, starts making shoes, thinks that the name Mercury is pretty good, you're going to have a lot of problem legally in stopping them from doing that. So you've got to register it, and that stops them. <clears throat> and uh, we tried to get it registered. We found out it was already pre-registered, so we couldn't have that. And the patent agent, 
he she advised me said well if you you can buy it i think they offered it for a thousand pounds and in those days a thousand pounds was like you know beyond we, we didn't have that sort of money uh, so he said bring me 10 names and i said well okay so we went back, we're sitting around, we make, you, you write all these names down. We had a lot of bird names, a lot of animal names. But 1943, when I was eight years old, I won an American dictionary in a running race. Uh, it was an 80 yards race. I won it and the prize was an American dictionary. I had it and I'm looking through. I like the letter R. And I'm just looking through the dictionary and came across Reebok, R-W-E-B-O-K. Had it been an English dictionary, it would have been R-H-E-B-O-K. Not as good, but R-W-E-B-O-K. So we got that, we got it registered. And of course, the biggest problem, that's okay, registering it, but the cost of registration in the UK, in Europe, in America, and Japan, these were the places. And, well, that cost was a high cost, and I, I had a lot of trouble, unable to pay his bill. The, that was the agent. I was unable to pay the bill. And I asked him sort of to accept post-dated checks, give me some time, I'll get round to it. But instead, no, he didn't. What they did, they, uh, they went to the courts for a winding up order. A winding up order means that if you don't pay your bill, they just close the company down. <clears throat> and it was at that point where I met Derek Waller. He, he was a, a brilliant lawyer. Uh, he was a, not an LLB, an MLB. He was a master of law. And uh, he just said, we'll see what we can do. However, he did get it turned over and they had to accept uh, a dated payment down the road. <clears throat> but I thought, well, Derek, I've never got to pay him. But it was 18 months before he sent me his bill because <clears throat> he knew very well I wouldn't have the money to pay him his 500 pounds or whatever it was at the time. So, <clears throat> that was, and, and then he became our lawyer and um, he... he he was a, an intellectual property lawyer, which is exactly what I wanted. Somebody would look after the name. <clears throat> and so he did many of our uh, arrangements. But that was just one of our almost nearly didn't get the moments. Joe, do you have an Instagram profile or no? Do you have, are you on Instagram or any social media? My team ah. failed to put it down here. Yes, we're on Instagram. What else are we on there? Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Facebook. How do I find you on Instagram? Reebok, the founder. Reebok, the founder. Reebok, the founder. That's awesome, man. Uh, it, it, where do you hang out? Like, do you do you hang out on any social medias in particular? Like, do you prefer Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, or do you even mess with it? Well. My wife, Julie, who set this up, she's the one who does all our technology. She's great. But LinkedIn, we were Instagram. LinkedIn and Instagram. Those two we're, we're on. You know, you're going to get inundated by, by tons of people wanting to talk to you. Well, I don't mind. <laughs> I'm quite happy to talk. Well, I can tell you this, you know, that you, it's not every day that you have somebody Oh, I need my readers. Damn it. There's, there it is right there. I'm sorry. Oh, my team's probably going duds right on your sheet, but it's not every day you can get somebody on the phone or on the call that actually built a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar organization, a worldwide name. It's something that, that I think everybody, you know, dreams of, but nobody, you know, not many actually can achieve it out of the, if you could look back, like when I do it, when I say, if I could look back, here's what I would do different. I would seek knowledge faster and I would invest money more wisely. I was a fool with, with, with money for the first probably 35, 40 years of my life. And I really didn't l read books. I didn't go to class. I didn't, you know, go to seminars. I literally had to learn everything the hard way. Um, so if I could change that, I would say, listen, I would seek knowledge every single day. Um, and I would invest my money more wisely. What, if you could go back, would you say is the main things to focus on from someone starting right now? <clears throat> well, I say the biggest problem today is that we have a lot more technologies done all, a lot of changes to life. It really has. We, uh, <clears throat> what I had to do, I had to travel. That's the one thing. But I, I think what you need to do is, is you need to know people. 
you you need to like people. You need to pick the right people because you don't you don't get to four million dollars, four billion dollars <throat> without a lot of people. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and th those are the people who will uh, who make your company for you. <clears throat> I like that. No people like people and pick the right people. Right. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, folks, you guys just got an incredible opportunity. I wish I had this going on live right now so I could ask if anyone has questions to email them in. But I would say just go to at Reebok, the founder on Instagram, Facebook, social media, ask questions yourself because that's the man right there that can answer them for you. His new book, or, well, it's, it's not necessarily new. How long has it been out? Because because it's fairly uh, new, no? Yes, first of October. Shoemaker is the name of it. Shoemaker. Go get that book and make sure you follow him. And man, I am honored to have this time with you today, Mr. Foster. I appreciate your, 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 your answers. And I thank you very much for coming on Dropping Bombs. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Brad. My pleasure, man. I'm unbelievably thankful. And Folks, share this out for other people that might want to hear it. And until next time, keep it real. This is Dropping Bombs with The Real Bradley. Subscribe at DroppingBombs.com.